write these plays. And he said, what I want to do is place the culture of black America on stage to demonstrate that it has the ability to offer sustenance so that when you leave your parents' house, you are not in the world alone. You have something that is yours. You have a ground to stand on. You have a viewpoint. And you have a way of proceeding in the world <coughs> that has been developed by your ancestors. And he has always been that person to really talk about that African American experience. Just a few things, there are so many things to note about August Wilson, but just some things to note, especially if you don't know much about him. He was born in 1945, he passed away in 2005. He was raised in an impoverished hill district in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He was raised by an African-American mother after his German father abandoned the family. He stopped attending school at 15 when he was falsely accused of plagiarizing a paper. So yes, a high school dropout is able to, um, to create and write and, uh, and, 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 and have um, happier prolific work. He wrote poetry and then turned his poetic eye towards plays. Two of his plays won a Pulitzer Prize, Fences and Piano Lessons. And just a little, another thing I want to emphasize about when he quit school, um, he had a lot of trouble dealing with the school system there. And at, that was his last straw when a, uh, when a um, teacher um, said that when he wrote this um, paper about Napoleon, it was, it was too good that he did not write this paper and, they, um, and he failed um, he failed him. And then he said, I'm, you know, I'm done. I'm done with school. But he knew he had a mom. And so he didn't go home and say, I quit school. He went to the library. And he read every book that, that, um, that there was in that library and read everything and rereading it. And he was self-taught. So it wasn't like he just did nothing. No, he did a lot. And so he was a self-taught man. And so Ruben Santiago, if you don't know, he's a graduate of Wayne State, um, of this theater program. And he, um, he also was a director of Jitney if, um, on Broadway. Um, of, few months ago closed last year, or last semester, I mean. He says that August Wilson is the frustration and the glory of being black. All of August Wilson plays are about being deprived of your song, your identity, and all of these characters are always searching for their identity. So, all of his plays. Gem of the Ocean, Joe Turner's Come and Gone, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, The Piano Lesson, Seven Guitars, Fences, Two Trains Running, Jitney, King Headley, and Radio Golf. And as you see, every one is um, um, in, in one decade of the 20th century. And, and with this, if you read every one from beginning, and end, um, beginning to end, you will begin to understand the African American ex experience and being able to hear those voices. When I read those plays, I hear my grandmother, I hear my uncle, I hear my mother my father, all of my family members, and all of my people, and it makes me proud. And this is something that my African American students especially need in their training, is to have voices that reflect their world. And he is such a great playwright to be able to understand and learn, and to um, delve in as an actor to understand style. So, I'm gonna have the students be able to give just briefly a little, um, um, with this process that we had with um, delving into Augustus Wilson, for them to talk about their experience. Uh, in a second, Alicia is going to talk about the four B's of August Wilson, and one of those B's is the blues. Uh, we did uh, uh, an exercise where we took a monologue <coughs> and we listened to a blues song, and while listening to that blues song, we repeated our monologue. And it was very interesting in the fact that there was different nuances and rhythms that we caught by listening to music and performing at the same time. And I thought that was really interesting. Uh, one thing I really enjoyed about this work is that uh, August Wilson writes in stories and he writes in circles. Uh, and I found, you know, the challenge for me was figuring out how within these stories and all of these repetitions uh, do these characters uh, sort of take this internal journey of switching beats. So I thought that was really uh, challenging. Like you would find in like a classical play in a way. It's like you got these monologues, these soliloquies, and you start here, you end there, and you're going all this way. And it's like he has all of these intricacies of uh, these characters travel on in these internal journeys. So I thought that was a challenge to find and embody. Uh, a lot of my experience um, as an African-American actor um, in studies, it, it's a Eurocentric uh, 
center of study. Uh, and, and you think that's the only place where heightened language is. Um, but then you realize while studying August Wilson that heightened language is in my world all the time. Uh, the uncle that says the long, long story and has a point at the end um, says it for a reason, and those shifts and re a repetition, a repetition are, are used to get to this point. And I, and I enjoyed in, in the study having to realize that August Wilson, these passages that I hear all my life, these sounds, are on the same level as Shakespeare. Um, studying it, it has such nuance and complexity. Just because I'm black doesn't mean that it's easy. I had, I, it wasn't easy to remember, memorize any of it. I had to get down and understand why these characters were saying what they were saying and making the shifts that they were making and give it the same due that I would a Shakespearean piece. I realized working and researching the other plays in the cycle that there are some through lines throughout all of the pieces like spirituality, like music, the black experience all together that will kind of chug its way through the entire cycle. However, he still takes the time to create each character so specifically in a way where you might have the archetype in a lot of plays of the mother. You might have that archetype of the villain, but none of these characters can be put into a box. They all have very specific things about them, and because he provides all that information, as an actor, you have so many venues to go in and really delve into these characters. So many different ways to make good choices, make interesting choices when it comes to learning how to dive into it and how to really bring it alive. W.E.B. Du Bois wrote a uh, critical essay on the Criteria of Negro Art, in which he describes what makes uh, African-American art beautiful. And in it, he talks about how uh, artistry from, and works of art from people who have been oppressed is inherently more beautiful than is given credit to uh, Eurocentric pieces <coughs> work. And after working on August Wilson, I feel like it's just, you know, there's, this isn't to discredit the works of uh, Miller or Williams and Shakespeare. But you just hear the language, uh, like what uh, Jasmine Tobias, Santania, and Ernest are all talking about. Uh, you just hear the the poetry, the artistry of uh, a specific people in a specific place, um, and how the African American experience can be and is just as valid as the uh, Eurocentric experiences in America and around the world. This is coming from a guy who loves Shakespeare. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to go to the four Bs. Thank you guys for going to set up for uh, seeing this coming up. And so, August Wilson, in all of his plays, he has what um, what you call the four Bs. And these four Bs affected the style in which he wrote. These four Bs provide a plot, they influence many of the smallest lines of dialogue, and determine several of his largest themes. So one of the four Bs, um, like, the, um, like they were talking about, the blues. And August Wilson says, anything you want to know about the black experience is in the blues. The blues is the book. It is the sacred book. Because back then, during that time, and he was inspired from an, um, a blues artist named Bessie Smith. And he listened to Bessie Smith, and once he was listening to that, he was like, oh, that rhythm, that's, um, that's a sound that I need to create. And he, was, I mean, he kept on listening to Bessie Smith all the time. And from there, even with some of his other plays, they may be rooted more with the jazz sound and whatnot, and even within, um, within the world of R&B. But everything is still rooted in the blues. All black music, all music really is rooted in the blues, and he is really taking that and using that to create that sound and that experience. Also, the second for me, Romare Bearden, famous artist. He, um, his artwork was in collages, um, different pieces put together. And when he um, you, um, saw these works, um, which is one of his, um, um, it was one of his most direct impact of his work, he also wanted to do collages within his work. And as you see with this one, Bill Hand's Lunch Bucket, and then also here, this is called Piano Lesson. 
these both directly inspired Joe Turner's Come and Gone and this one, The Pianoist. Because you see this one, a piano, you know, and a little, um, a little child, and the mother is looking over her as she is playing the piano, and then all of a sudden this story comes out, and then you have this wonderful play. And all of these things on history, and these little pieces together, makes up that world, and he creates that within his plays. And so now with the third of the four Bs, Amiri Baraka. Um, yeah, sorry about that, that just moved and whatnot. But Baraka, he is a pioneer in the black theater movement, and he used political activism in his plays. And he was a prolific playwright at, um, at the same time, and within his plays, and even within the theater that he was talking about, which is revolutionary theater, he was all about forcing change. But what was different with um, August Wilson is that he embodied spirituality than it being visceral. And he, um, he took on the offender in a non-physical form. And then the last of the um, four Bs is Jorge Luis Borges, and he's an Argentinian essayist and short story writer. And they both write of a man's need to fulfill his destiny and understand his place within a historical continuum. And as with all of them, if you've ever read any of his plays, that you can like just remember and think like, oh yeah, it does have that in there. And so, going into character, he's a cultural anthropologist. If they had that during that time, the name and that major and whatnot, he probably, you know, he probably would have said, yeah, maybe I may go and look into it that way. But he just naturally, he was a cultural anthropologist because he sat around everywhere. He sat around at the coffee shops, at the restaurants, and just observed people and took them in, listening to their words, taking, taking in how they moved, how they um, act, um, acted and reacted to people. And with the, all the old men at the barber shop, listening to those conversations, you know, a lot of his plays, it's a lot of, it's a lot of men in his plays, and so, and because he hung around a lot of men growing up, and so he was taking in all those conversations, all those nuances, and that's how he, how he was able to create these deep and profound characters. And so now we're going to go into King Headley, and they're going to talk about what it's about and go into that scene. is the ninth play of August Wilson's Century Cycle. <coughs> Set in Pittsburgh's Hill District in 1985, King is an ex con trying to overhaul his life by selling stolen refrigerators. King's endless struggle to save $10,000 to open a video store is plagued by the socioeconomic obstacles crippling minorities living under policies enacted by the Reagan administration. Considered Wilson's darkest play, King Headley II embraces the grit of the 80s and questions how one can survive in a world where the people have abandoned the teachings of the ancestors and battle new institutional barriers unarmed with no scape in sight. King Headley II also revisits characters from Wilson's earlier play, Seven Guitars. In the following scene, Mr. King's lifelong friend has some troubling news about the sales that he must tell his determined partner. Look at that. See that, girl? See that? Yeah, I see. Ruby tell me my dirt ain't worth nothing. It's mine. It's worth it to have. I ain't gonna let nobody take it. Talk about my dirt ain't worth nothing. Like I need some good dirt. A seed is a seed. A seed will grow in dirt. Hey, look at that. Yeah, I see. How many them refrigerators you sell? I sold two more. One man owe me fifty dollars. Say he gonna pay me on Tuesday. How many you sell? I sold three. That makes seven. We ain't got but four more days to sell as many as we can. Then they're gonna move them down to Philadelphia, and we be done missed our opportunity. I be asking everybody. You just ain't asked the right people. It ain't like they TVs. TVs would be easier. This better than TVs. Everybody already got a TV. But everybody be thinking about getting a new refrigerator, and they don't ever get around to it. That's when you walk up and offer them a brand new GE refrigerator for $200. That make you a hero. People be seeing you 10 years from now smile when they see you. They'll never forget where they got that refrigerator from. Hey, King, I was thinking, I want to get my money out the pot. Need to get me some furniture. <laughs> no. <laughs> nah. We're supposed to get the video store. We split the pot and there won't be nothing to get it with. 
We got around six thousand dollars. We don't need but four more. I ain't gonna be poor all my life. See, you don't believe. I believe it. I just need me some furniture. I need two. I need two hundred and twenty-five dollars to get my phone back on. Natasha talked to some nigga in Baltimore for six hours. I need two. You don't hear me talking about dipping in the pot. See, cuz I believe. I look at that sign saying Miller Auto Parts. They just don't believe it can say Headley Auto Parts or Carter Auto Parts. Or you can have one say Royal Videos. How do you think Miller got that Auto Parts store? Cuz he didn't dip in the pot. I need to get me some money. We can get the video store later. I just want my money. It's been sitting in the pot all that time. I don't even know what a pot is. You say you got it, but I ain't seen it. I just want my money. <laughs> we already talked to the man about renting a place. He said come back when we're ready. We almost ready! Now you're talking about splitting the pot. You want your money. This why niggas ain't got nothing now. They don't believe me. I just want my money. I need it. I got to get me some furniture. I need the money from the refrigerator so I can get my phone back on. Time to get pregnant. She want a car. I got to buy a crib, a stroller. Got to figure out how to get room in one of these refrigerators. I got the light bill, the gas bill. Got to get some food, but I ain't said nothing about dipping in the pot. You're supposed to pretend like it ain't there. I didn't know Tiny was pregnant. I just found out myself. Remember when we used to play touch football and everybody would look at me and we do that double reverse and I'd hand off to you? I was a touchdown every time. I used to tell Nisi I wanted to have a baby. Wanted somebody to hand the ball off to. It took me all this time. Now time to pregnant. It's like I finally did something right. That's why you got to leave your money in the pot. I don't want them to go off without enough. I'm supposed to get a raise on my job, but I can't count on that. I need some place to sleep. I just want my money. We can start another pot later. Okay. Okay. <sighs> that jewelry store we was talking about, and I told you I didn't want to do that. Down there on Fifth Avenue, I told the distributors. I told you we could take that easy. Might get around twenty or thirty thousand. The lease will be around ten thousand. Leave your money in the pot. We hit the jewelry store. We have another video store, and you can still get some furniture. All right, when we do it. Got to do it soon. Yeah. I need me some furniture. <coughs> I can take off work Wednesday. That's as good a time as any Wednesday slow day. All right, we'll do it Wednesday. So Pete Headley is viewed as a jazz opera because it has operatic confessions. King Headley is a guy who has a troubled life, and if you've read um, if you've read King Headley, then I hope you would have read before Seven Guitars, because um, 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 well, actually King Headley II, I um, did not put that up there, but it's right there up there that he is a descendant of that story of what happened. I don't want to really get into details on all of that, but with this, he has big dreams and big life, but he's a very troubled man who's, um, who just got out of jail and continues to do a lot of troubling things. But um, so much of it and all the characters within it, they operate on a mythic level, larger than life, filled with grand motives and of rage, deception, and revenge. So within that world, and what we're about to do is piano lesson, storytelling. All August Wilson's plays have storytelling in it. And within that um, storytelling is that spiritualism that's connected all the way back to Africa and um, um, being able to bring those stories and connect it and root it um, through your ancestors and that blood memory. And being able to be proud of your ancestors and from where you've come from. And so now we're gonna go into piano lesson. 36 Pittsburgh is the backdrop to the Charles family in August Wilson's The Piano Lesson. The play centers around the conflict between brother and sister who argue about the fate of the family heirloom an ornately carved piano. <coughs> the brother Boy Willie is a sharecropper who wants to sell the piano to buy the land where his ancestors toiled as slaves. The sister Bernice remains absolute about keeping the piano, which shows the carved faces of the great grandfather's wife and son during the days of their enslavement. This scene takes place between sister Bernice and Avery, an inspiring preacher with a desire to marry Bernice. 
As he makes attempts to pursue her, she, she counters with her concerns about the family heirloom, the constant <coughs> threat of Sutter's ghost, and her trepidation to commit following her husband's death. Bernice, I'll be at home and I get to thinking you up here and I'm down there. I get to thinking what it looked like to have a preacher that ain't married. It makes for a better congregation when a preacher is settled down and married. Avery, not now. I was just fixing to take my bath. You know how I feel about you, Bernice. Now, I done got the place for Mr. Cohen. I get the money from the bank and I can fix it up real nice. They give me a 10 cents an hour raise down there on the job. Now, Bernice, I ain't got much in the way of comforts. I got a hole in my pocket about as far as money is concerned. I ain't never found no way through life to a woman I care about like I care about you. I need that. I need somebody on my bond side. I need a woman that fits in my hand. Avery, I ain't ready to get married. You too young a woman to close up, Bernice. Ain't nobody said nothing about closing up. I got a lot of women left in me. Where's it at? When's the last time you looked at it? That's a nasty thing to say. And you call yourself a preacher. Anytime I get anywhere near you, you push me away. I got enough <coughs> on my hands with Marie. I got enough people to love and take care of. Who you got to love you? Can't nobody get close enough to you. Doka can't have say nothing to you. You jump all over boy, Willie. Who you got to love you, Bernice? Are you trying to tell me that a woman can't be nothing unless she got a man? <coughs> but you all right. You could just walk out of here without me, without a woman, and still be a man, and that's all right. Ain't nobody going to ask you, Avery, who you got to love you. And that's all right for you. But everybody going to be worried about Bernice. How's she going to take care of herself? How's she going to raise that child without a man? Wonder what's she going to do with herself? How's she going to live like that? Everybody got all types of questions for Bernice. Everybody telling me I can't be a woman unless I got a man. Well, you tell me, Avery. You know. How much a woman am I? It wasn't me, Bernice. You can't blame me for nobody else. I own up to my own shortcomings, but you can't blame me for Crawley or nobody else. I ain't blaming nobody for nothing. I'm just stating facts. How long are you going to carry Crawley with you? Bernice, it's been over three years. At some point, you've got to let go and go on. Life's got all kinds of twists and turns. That don't mean you stop living. That don't mean you cut yourself off from life. You can't go through life carrying Crawley's ghost with you. Crawley's been dead three years. Three years, Bernice. I know how long Crawley's been dead. You ain't got to tell me that. I just ain't ready to get married now. What is you ready for, Bernice? You're just going to drift along from day to day? Life is more than making it from one day to another. You're going to look up one day and it's all going to be past you. Life is going to be gone out of your hands. There won't be enough to make nothing with. I'm standing here now, Bernice, but I don't know how much longer I'm going to be standing here waiting on you. Avery, I told you, when you get your church, we'll sit down and we'll talk about this. I got too much to deal with right now. Boy Willie and the piano and, and Sutter's ghost. I thought I might be seeing things, but Maritha done seen Sutter's ghost too. When that happened, Bernice? When I came back yesterday, me and Boy Willie was arguing about the piano and, and Sutter's ghost was standing at the top of the stairs. Maritha's scared to go to sleep up there now. Maybe, maybe if you bless the house, he'll go away. I don't know, Bernice. I don't know if I should fool around or something like that. I can't have Marie the scared to go to sleep up there. Seem like if you bless the house, he'll go away. You might have to have a special kind of preacher to do something like that. I keep telling myself, when boy Willie leave, he'll go on to leave with him. I believe boy Willie pushed him down that well. That's been going down there a long time. The ghost of the yellow dog been pushing people in their wells long before Boy Willie got grown. Somebody down there pushing up people in their wells. 
They ain't just up their bed. The wind ain't pushed them in their wells. I don't know. God works in mysterious ways. He ain't pushing nobody in their wells. <laughs> he caused it to happen. God is the great cause and he can do anything. He parted the Red Sea. He said, I will smite my enemies. Reverend Thompson used to preach on the ghost of the yellow dog as the hand of God. I don't care who preached what. Somebody down there pushing up people in their wells. <laughs> Somebody like Boy Willie. I can see him doing something like that. Ain't nobody gonna tell me that son just up and fell in his well. I believe Boy Willie pushed him <laughs> so he can get his land. What do you say about Boy Willie selling that piano? Dogger don't want no part to that piano. He ain't never want no parts. He blamed himself for not staying behind the Papa Boy Charles. He washed his hands of that piano a long time ago. He didn't want me to bring it up here, but I wasn't going to leave it down there. Well, it seemed to me somebody ought to talk to Boy Willie. He ain't nobody talk to Boy Willie. He has been that way all his life. Mama Ola had her hands full trying to talk to Boy Willie. He don't listen to nobody. He just like my daddy. He get his mind fixed on something. And can't nobody turn from it. You want to start a choir at the church. You know, maybe if he seen you was doing something with it, if you told him he was going to put it in my church, maybe he'd see it different. Woo! You want to put it down in the church and start a choir. The Bible says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Maybe a boy Willie really seen you was doing something with it, he'd see it different. Avery. I done told you. I don't want to play on that piano. Ain't no need in you to keep talking this quiet stuff. When my mama died, I shut the top of that piano and I ain't never opened it since. I was only playing it for her. When my daddy died, it seemed like, like all her life went into that piano. She used to have me playing on it. Have Miss Ula come in and teach me, say, when I play, she can hear my daddy talking to me. I used to think the pictures come alive and walk through the house. Sometimes, late at night, I can hear my mama talking to me. I said, that ain't gonna be me. I don't play on that piano because I don't want to wake up the spirits. They ain't never be walking around in this house. You better put that behind you, Bernice. I got Maritha playing on it. She don't know nothing about it. Let her, let her go on and become a school teacher or something. She don't got to carry all that with her. She, she got a chance I didn't have. I'm not going to burden her with that piano. You got to put that behind you, Bernice. That's the same thing like Crawley. Everybody's got stones in their pathway. You can step over them or walk around them. You picking them up and carrying them with you. All you gotta do is set them down by the side of the road. You ain't got to carry them with you. You can walk over there right now and play that piano. You can walk over there right now and God will walk over there with you. Right now, you can set that sack of stones down by the side of the road and walk away from it. You ain't got to carry it with you. You can do it right now. Come on, Bernice. Set it down and walk away from it. Come on, play old ship of Zion. Walk over here and claim it as an instrument of the Lord. You can walk over here right now and make it into a celebration. <clears throat> Avery, just go on and let me finish my bath. All right. All right, Bernice. I'm going to go home. I'm going to go home and read up on my Bible, and tomorrow, if the good Lord give me strength tomorrow, I'm going to come by and bless the house and show you the power of the Lord. It's going to be all right, Bernice. God said he will soothe the troubled waters. I'll come by tomorrow and bless the house.
and within that, these components, is high stylized language created from poor oppressed people, the black vernacular. When traditionally it's used as something to look down on, he raises it up as something to, um, to really love and to really discover. His musicality, like I talked before about the blues, and then also within that framework, the lyrical poetry, because he, he was trained first as a, um, as a poet, and then he uses poetry within his language and his work. And now we're going to go to Jitney Taxi Drivers in 1977, Pittsburgh. The city is planning to close the Jitney station as their neighborhood is being gentrified. In this final week, the lives of these five men collide and entangle as they each figure out how to move forward. 22-year-old Youngblood is finding his song, working in the Jitney station and in various menial jobs to become a man, to redeem himself from a past of mistakes and to provide a better life for his girlfriend, Rena, and his two-year-old son, Jesse. Attempting to buy a house and surprise Rena with it, Youngblood young blood asks for the help of Rena's sister, Peaches, and the two spend a lot of time together. Turnbow, one of the older Jitney taxi drivers, insinuates an affair between the two, and he brings this to Rena's attention. Rena conf confronts young blood, and they argue. Having spent the night at the Jitney station, Rena comes back to confront young blood the next morning. What you want around here? I want to see you. You didn't come home last night. That's right. What for? You tell me, huh? What I'm gonna come home for? Being as how you might not be there. Where'd you go? But you care about where I went. I stayed here. If you got to know. I slept on the couch. What am I gonna come home for with you making all them stupid accusations? I ain't made no accusations. I just said I knew about you and Peach. Somebody tell you they seen your sister in my car and you jumped to conclusions. You don't know what I'm doing. That's right. I don't know what you're doing. That's what I'm saying. It ain't like you ain't got no track record. If I remember correctly, you was leading the parade. I'm here. That should be enough. If I didn't want to be here, I'd be somewhere else. Why can't you just take that? Because it's not enough. I don't want somebody to think just because they're there, that's enough. I want somebody who's going to share with me, not hide things from me. You want to know what I was hiding from you? I tell you, I've been hustling, working day and night, while you accuse me of running the streets. And all I'm trying to do is save enough money so I can buy a house so you and Jesse can have someplace decent to live. I asked Peaches if she would go with me to look at houses because I wanted to surprise you. I wanted to pull a truck up to the house and say, come on, baby, we moving. And drive on out to Penn Hills and pull that truck up in front of one of them houses and say, this is yours. This is your house, baby. That's what she was trying to hide from you. That's why Turnbow seen her riding in my car all the time. I found a house. And I come up $150 short from closing the deal, and I come and I took the $80 out the drawer. A house? A house, Donnell? You bought a house without me. I wanted to surprise you. You gonna surprise me with a house? <laughs> Don't do that. A new TV, maybe. A radio, a couch, a refrigerator, okay. But you can't surprise me with a house I didn't even have a chance to pick out. That's what you've been doing. That's the debt you had to pay. You always saying you don't want to live your whole life in a project. So now you ain't bought no house without me. How many times in your life do you get to pick out a house? Wait till you see it. It's real nice. It's all on one floor. It's got a little basement, like a little den. We can put the TV down there. I told myself Rena's going to like this. Wait till she see I bought her a house. No. <laughs> you brought a den for Darnell. That's what you did. So you can sit down there and watch your football games. But what about the kitchen? The bathroom? How many windows does it have in the bedroom? Is this a place for Jesse to play? How much closet space does it have? You can't just surprise me with the house. And I'm supposed to say, oh, Darnell, that's nice. One time I would have. But I'm not 17 no more. I have responsibilities. 
I want to know if I have a hookup for a washer and dryer because I got to wash Jesse's clothes. I want to know if they have a yard and do it how it fits. And how far does Jesse have to go to school? I ain't thinking about where to put the TV. That's not what's important to me. And you're supposed to know, Donna. You're supposed to know what's important to me like I'm supposed to know what's important to you. I'm not asking you to do it by yourself. I'm here with you. We in this together. See, house or no house, we still ain't got the food money. But had you come to me, had you shared that with me, we could have gone to my mother and we could have got $80 for the house and still had money for the food. You just did it all wrong, Donnell. I mean, you did the right thing, but you did it wrong. No matter what I do, it's going to come out wrong with you. That's why you jumped to conclusions. That's why you accused me of running the peaches. You can't look and see that I quit going to parties all the time. That I quit running with Barbara and Earl. That I quit chasing women. You just look at me and see the old Darnell. If you can't change the way you look at me, then I may as well surrender now. I can't beat your memory of who I was if you can't see I've changed. I go out here and work like a dog to try and do something nice for you. And no matter what I do, I can't never do it right because all you see is the way I used to be. You don't see the new Darnell. You don't see I've changed. I know people change, but I know they can slip back too. No, Rita! People believe what they want to believe, what they set up in their mind to believe. I know what it looked like when I was gone all the time and not bringing home any money, but you could have noticed that I was tired. You could have said, Darnell ain't talking too much because he's tired. You could have noticed that I didn't act like somebody running the streets. That I didn't come home smelling like alcohol and perfume. That I didn't dress like somebody running the streets. If you had thought it all the way through, you could have noticed how excited I was when I got that UPS job. How I asked you if I could take it. You would have noticed how I was playing things. That I wasn't sitting around drinking beer and playing cards. How I would get up early on Sunday and go out to the airport to try to make a few extra dollars before the Disney station opened. But you ain't seen all that. You ain't seen the new Darnell. You still working up your memory. <laughs> but the past is over and done with. I'm thinking about the future. You're not the only one who think about Jesse. That's why I'm trying to do something different. That's why I'm trying to buy a house. Maybe I should have told you about the house. Maybe I did do it wrong, but I've done it. I tried to show you I love you, but what I did for it. Okay, Darnell. You right. I could have seen all that. But what you ain't looking at is I've changed too. We both different people than we were when we first fell in love. I still love you, Darnell. But love can only go so far. When we were in high school, that was enough. That was the world, that was everything. But it ain't everything no more. I don't have all the answers. Sometimes I don't even have the right questions. But I do know it takes two to find them. All I know is we got somebody. A little two-year-old boy counting on us. I know that when you put your hand in mine, you've got to say, Darnell's not going to let me down. He loves me. I don't want to make no more mistakes in life. I don't want to do nothing to mess this up. I don't want to. Get old, be talking about, I had me this little old gal one time, but I ain't seen her in 22 years. If that's not what you want, then you got to let me know, Darnell. We don't know what's important to each other and learn to share that. We ain't going to make it. We can't make it with each other. I want you, baby. I told you that. You were already my pride. <coughs> want you want to be my joy. Because there ain't but one thing I did wrong. Stay away 
from you. If there are any questions, I know the time is. Has moved on, but if you have any questions, feel free to ask. 67 and Skeleton Crew. By the way, Skeleton Crew is being produced at the Detroit Public Theater, and it closes this um, this weekend. Just putting a little extra plug in on that. But um, but yes, she she um she read August Wilson from beginning to end and was inspired about wow this man he writes all these plays and it's all based in Pittsburgh in the Hill District about his hometown. I want to do something about my hometown so people can have a different view of Detroit. So yes, she specifically used that and was inspired by that to um, be able to do that. The other playwrights, yes, they were inspired by it, but not necessarily literally in making a play cycle, but within their work in um, basically being able to use our history to um, to continue on that tradition, to, um, um, to use it as a way of, as history and a way of having pride about oneself and focusing on the African American experience. Anybody? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, in most of these playwrights, I see that it's a uh, broken English. Do you think that's needed to put emphasis on the black experience, you know, history and whatnot? Um, well, it just depends on your um, viewpoint um, um, of broken English. Like, um, like I said before, like um, the black vernacular, he uses that because in the 20s and the 30s and whatnot, there were more African Americans who were uneducated and using that to write that experience. And listening to those people of that time period and writing it within their voices. And that's how it's stylized in that way. And I think it is needed for everyone. If you're write, um, writing about the Latino community, uh, any, anybody's community, you need to write from their point of view and using their voice. And, and, so, and, and, um, I, I, um, and so many times people use that broken English or saying black vernacular or black English as something to look down upon, but it's not the case and not for me. And the more I really do um, really delve into this, I don't look at that as a bad thing. I think it's needed when it is um, when you are delving into those type of characters. Um, now, if you're doing a character who grew up totally somewhere different, you know, and it, that would be kind of weird if you use that um, um, that type of language. But for these characters, the, um, those um, that sound is needed. I want to comment on the language issue because naturality. Uh, Black American language, that is where you look at most of all of the major literary accomplishments. The poetry comes from the folk tradition. The poetry comes from the idiom of the people who speak it. Mm -hmm. um, it is in the same way that you talk about the blues. The blues is not written in the standard English. Mm -hmm. Jazz defies any sort of definition of English. Mm -hmm. The creative limitations of standard English uh, really would adversely affect the presentation of creativity coming out of the black community, for that matter, almost any American community. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's not broken, it's transcendent. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. So true. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and 
and yes, it is. And um, and this and this power in what we have. So many times I see so many students who are broken that come into this um, school, especially the undergrads who don't know who they are, and they and they feel like they have to come here and take away themselves. And no, you need to bring that with you because there's power in that. And and in the school system, you don't learn about your history. And I think that's so sad, and it hurts me to my heart that people come here and they're ashamed about who they are as a people and um and I, that's why I try to bring up and, and have us celebrate who um celebrate who we are because if we don't if then all of our history is going to be erased. We need to celebrate it. We need to bring that, you know, we need to say it's transcending. The, the way we use our words makes a difference because it's power in our language and it's power in what we do. And so, so just things like this with August Wilson, reading these plays, giving someone August Wilson instead of other plays, you know, first, they can be able to learn about their history and be proud of it naturally versus, okay, I have to do all this work to learn about something black as if it's a bad thing. And it needs to be um, thought of as a good thing, as a standard. And, um, and so, yeah, any other question? I, 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 I usually don't like to comment on these things, but I just can't help sharing with this audience the kind of epiphany the students in my current African American vernacular English course, are, the, the epiphany they are experiencing. Many of them came into that class thinking about African American vernacular English being something that, as my colleague over there said, broke the English. And they are marveling at the systemicity which we are revealing in that classroom. African Americans <coughs> and non African Americans are learning for the first time that what they think about as broken English is particularly systematic and that there are rules governing the use of, and the non-use. When he last night, I mean, this was Tuesday, a teacher Monday, last night I put up a set of uh, incorrect African-American American sentences. And the African-Americans in the class said, <laughs> You can't say it that way. In fact, they realize that, and the non-African Americans say, what's this? And so they were amazed when I pointed to what their systemicity is. And so, so um, I'm very pleased that to this audience, somebody of your distinction uh, and your achievements could stand up there and speak, uh, speak uh, positively about African-American English. And the first, I'm going to finish my sermon in a minute. <laughs> the first sequence that you saw there, there was this, and I saw that over and over again. If nobody can tell me anything, that, that construction, which in standard English would, would appear to be uh, a question, but it is actually a statement. And you can't say, you can't say that any way other than you have to be a, a, a negative followed by a negative. <laughs> but you, you can't say uh, in anybody, it's, 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 not, it's, it's wrong. So <laughs> students were able to see that. So thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk about that class. And, and also adding with that, it's about just like August Wilson, you know, being deprived of your song, you know, finding your song. And, and I tell my students, I want them through this discovery to find their song, their identity. Could you consider giving this again at another venue? I'm thinking of sure. the, the Wayne State SOAR thing, Society of Active Retirees. The old oh, yeah, I've done something for them and before. I think, that, I think you would get a huge audience for it. So I love these plays. I've read them all. I've seen three of them. And I was so impressed with your level of performance. Thank really, you. really good direction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, no problem. Yeah, I can afterwards we can talk. Any other questions? I want to know where you get that. 
Well, this was at a black theater festival in North Carolina, which is Salem, North Carolina. Oh, yes. The National Black Theater Festival. Yes. It was a vendor who like, of course. like makes these so hand. Um, okay. How long ago? Thank you. Oh, um, last that. summer. Oh. <laughs> You said in storytelling there's spiritualism, ancestors, and something else in this life. Oh, um, blood memory. Oh, okay. Um, spiritualism. Thank you. We had a speech, because uh, I'm uh, with the humanities department, we do a lot of brown bag speeches and talks, and uh, the last talk that we went to, somebody argued with the fact that they said that, like, hate and, I guess, uh, anger can't be transcended transcended through DNA or through generations, do you agree or disagree with that statement? Um, <laughs> I, 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 um, it, it can't be. I disagree because the fact that so much of within, I can say, I can't speak for every culture, but I can say as um, for, um, um, for with my experience as, a, as an African American, I'm still trying to relearn the things that I say to people on how I think about myself. And like um, culturally, we'll say like things about hair, which is a very easy point to make. That you know, get to that kitchen, and we <coughs> say things that insult each other, and we're we're right, um, we're, we we are surrounded by all this negativity that we have towards each other. You know, don't go don't go and show your color. It's like that. Why can't I show my color? I got to be a white person to be able to be accepted in this community. I'm gonna show my color. What's wrong with me projecting and, and, and showing who I am and being black and showing blackness if I want to? You know what's wrong with that? And so many times we're told those things in our life that that's how we are. You know that we're always trying to hide who we are and we're walking around confused and we don't. Um, and all all of a sudden our drum is not being played. So no, I, I don't agree with that, but I would have to like listen to that context to understand because I don't want to like discount another scholar as if because I have no idea I wasn't there at that one. I think possibly just in terms of things that I've read, the idea that um, there are some conversations and some theories out there that um, black people have inherited, you know, the consequences of slavery, but they mean like literally. Genetics passed on, and um, I think with you know it's not my area, but uh, I think more so with, in, in particular what you were talking about things that are carried through culturally, mm -hmm. certain kinds of attitudes that have persisted, which I think is different. Yeah, racial awareness, and, and I don't think that um, I don't think you need to go back to slavery. That's enough bullshit out here. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>